The Coonhound Collective Podcast is brought to you by CZ Welding and Custom Dog Boxes. Dog boxes built by hunters for hunters. Check these guys out today. This is your host, Jason Snurgrove, and I will be your guide as we journey down the road to pleasure hunt or hitting the long trail to those great cop hunts. This is the Coonhound Collective Podcast. Welcome to the Coonhound Collective Podcast this week. This week I have traveled to Greenwood, Mississippi, and I am sitting here with Mr. Eddie Muse. Mr. Eddie, how's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. Real good, in fact. Yeah, we're get, getting a little rain here. Yeah, getting a lot of rain. Just spot it every day. You look like we're getting a shower. I think we live in Florida now. <laughs> well, Mr. Eddie, I, I don't know that you really need an introduction, but go ahead and tell everybody where you're from and kind of kind of what you did, do for a living and stuff like that. Okay, well, I'm uh, Eddie Muse. I'm from Greenwood, Mississippi. I was born in Craigside, Mississippi, which is about five miles north of here toward Money, Mississippi. And when I was raining as much like today, in fact, I was born on August 28th, and in a week, if I live that long, I'll be 78. And the day I was born, it was some muddy. We lived at a, Daddy had a farm. We lived at the end of a gumbo field road, and uh, my mama was milking, and I was in there out fixing to have me and went to labor. And Daddy hooked the wagon up to go get the midwife, and the wagon wheels bogged up with gumbo and wouldn't go. So he unhooked the mule, threw the cotton sack over his back, and loped on up the road to about three miles where the midwife lived and forced her to get on the mule with him and rode back. And I was already here premature, so my life started out pretty tough right from the start. Yeah. But, well, well I, I didn't know that, but... On August the 28th, I'll be 44 years old. Is that's that my right? birth, That's my birthday, too. Yeah, I'll so, be 78 if I make it. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So uh, did you always grow up right around here? I've lived here all my life till uh, the only time I've been away from here was in the Army from 1966 to 69. And a three-year term, went to a uh, career and come back and stationed in Colorado. And uh, come on home, and I started coon hunting before that. When I was a kid, I went to visit a friend, spend the night with him, a school friend. I was about nine years old. I didn't have nothing but tennis shoes to wear, and the ground was froze. And them guys, that guy's daddy and a couple of his uncles were going coon hunting. And, man, I was cried and cried and cried because I wanted to go. And finally, the mama found a, some kind of old coat and put on me and never did find no boots and that would fit me. And I went coon hunting with them. We never treated a coon that night. I know we made a tree, and it was a den tree, and then they took an ax and cut it down, and there wasn't nothing in it. And uh, got home about 4 o'clock in the morning. My feet were froze, and, and I remember Mr. Vining saying, well, he, we broke him. He'll never go coon hunting again as long as he lives. But uh, obviously they didn't break me when I was, uh, I'm going to say I was about 13, 14 years old. I hunted with Breland Ainsworth and Cleveland Ainsworth. Every night they would let me go. And uh, that, that's why I really got started coon hunting. This is a guy that uh, I sold newspapers as a young guy teenagers i think ninth grade in high school and uh this man that worked up there at the manufacturing company where i sold them papers give me a of course it wasn't registered but he gave me a black and tan puppy and i lived in town and the puppy run loose and it was a natural they'd trail cats up and trim of course i didn't know anything about it but eventually it got run over because i didn't have a pen or nowhere to put it or nothing but uh, I was still coon up with them guys. And when I got out of the Army, me and D. Turner went to coon hunting together real regular. He's a farmer. He's a farm manager. And he lived at a place up north of here, just a little piece. And I'd go every night anybody would go. And I still had never competition on it. And I run a uniform route. Right after I got out of the Army, I was already married. Me and Judy was married at that time. 
And uh, I'd go through Inverness, Mississippi, and Bill Ed Tennant lived there. And the first wheat light he ever sold that was a headlamp, I bought it. I was the first one to ever own one. And that's a pretty good story in itself, because D. Whit Burns, he's dead now, but he lived at Kosciuszko, Mississippi, Williamsville, actually. And um, Bill Tennant told me on a Sunday morning, he said, I want you to go over there with me. And he, he can't get his light to work, and you're the only one that owns one. See if you can figure out what's wrong. Well, when we got over there, we drove all the way over there, and we got over I walked in there and looked at his light, where he had it plugged up, and he never turned it hard enough for that thing. That ball to click in there and make it charge, but... That's a pretty good story. That, that guy was a great guy. Him and the White Burns were super good people. And good horsemen, too, you know. But uh, he sold, Bill Ed sold me a dog called Shine. And, of course, his own credit cause didn't have no money. But he told me, he said, when you get through hunting this winter, you bring your hides over here and sell them, and we'll get that dog paid for. I don't forget, I think I'll get $250 for that dog. It was a great dog. It didn't wouldn't stay treed. Purdy dog had a blaze face, a white tip on his tail, and four white stocking feet, and he was so black he's almost purple. Well, I started competition hunting with that dog. That's the first dog I ever carried a competition hunting. I guess I filled a storage room full of trophies with him. Three hour hunts back then. And uh, he was a way advanced over his Talks back then did a lot of trailing. He did a lot of slick trend and tree some coons too along the way. You know, he wasn't good, but uh, I remember I used to carry weaners in my pocket and I'd cut my light off and slip in there to him on the tree because he, he'd leave every time he'd go in there. And it took me about three months before I ever got him where he'd stay, but I finally got him where he'd stay. I met an old guy up there at uh, the floor. Mississippi, up there at Mile Mason, must have all reported one night hunting. He hunted by himself all the time. He never competition hunted or nothing. He had some super good dogs. But he told me, he said, Eddie, quit giving that dog and weenus. When you go to that tree, just walk in there and time back and pet him real good. So when you shoot that coon out, don't let him have it, put it in the vest. I thought to myself, now that ain't very good advice training a dog. But I tried it. And it worked immediately. I never had no more trouble with it. And uh, I guess the first rested dog I ever had, I traded a pretty good grade dog to Jarvis Umpers for a puppy, just a puppy. And uh, she never was much. She turned out all right. And from there, I got to know Rod Lapone, you know, and got some good dogs from him, or good pups from him. I never. Never could buy a dog, didn't have that much money. But uh, I trained several pretty good black and tans, and Ace wasn't near about the first one. I don't know, I did buy one before I had Ace. I bought Langford's Big Hoss. That was a real nice dog, black and tan. But uh, long story short, I know everybody's interested in what Ace done and everything. I'll just go into that. Before before you get in there, that that other dog you were talking about there, what what was he out of? The shine dog. That and then the the other dog there a afterwards. Shine uh, was a great dog. Okay. Langford's big horse was out of Mr. Fred Sanders' uh, Hank dog, and I can't remember the bottom side. But he was a pretty intelligent dog himself. No, Hank was a real smart dog. I think horse was probably. If I had to say, in my opinion, Hoss was probably the better coon dog, but that dog was, Mr. Fred's dog was real popular back then, you know, that Hank dog. I think, uh, I can't remember if Mike Crockett's Hickey Hayes dog was uh, all for Hank. I think he was all for Hank. He's either all for him or a litter mate, but both of them dogs were real good dogs, advanced dogs, you know. But I had a dog at a raise called Sissy. It's off some local dogs here. I bought a dog called, called him Jackhammer. And the reason I called him Jackhammer, every time he barked on the tree, his feet would be down, and the next bark he'd bounce, and his feet would be up, never touching the tree. And the next time it'd be down, he'd bark, and that's the way he treed the whole time he treed. And we bred him just to a local jip here 
And I can't remember who even owned the Jeep. Yes, I do. It was uh, David Westmoreland. But anyway, we bred them and raised a litter of puppies, and I guess every one of them turned out to be coon dogs. And I had one of them, and uh, Riley come over here hunting with me, Riley LaFoon, and uh, had Jeep split tree and tree looked pretty good, real good, in fact. And he, long story short, he wound up buying her. I didn't want to sell, I didn't ever for sale, but he bought her. It wasn't hard to buy one for me. If I had done about what I thought I needed to do with them, they could be sold pretty quick. And I enjoyed that. That's what I enjoyed about coon hunting, is training the dog up and selling it for a decent amount of money mm-hmm. or culling it one or the other. But uh, anyway, he bought that dog. Me and Riley got to be really good friends. That's way before we owned Super Sting. And then as time went on, of course, he bought Super Sting, and I had a dog that belonged that I'd bought from him. Uh, let me think just a second now. I think that dog was a, it was a male dog, and he was pretty rough on the tree. He was rough anywhere, but he was a coon trier, and he was off a super sting, and uh, Jeff was off a Riley's old prank dog. And I traded him back to Riley for Ace's mama, and... She didn't have a, she had a litter of puppies and they all died of mastitis except one and I had to pick the litter in the deal, in the, in the trade deal. So I drove all the way to Louisiana one afternoon, me and Dee Turner, and picked that puppy up. And while I was there, I bought a mule trailer from Riley. And uh, Riley wanted that puppy, he didn't want to let me have it, but it, you know, it wasn't but one, he, he kept saying he'd buy it, but I wouldn't sell it. And I, I got the puppy and come on back home with it. And then I picked up another puppy, and I can't remember what he was all for, but it's all some Myers bred dogs, it's both big, real, real high part bred dogs, I had both of them at the same time. And I hunted with Clarence Stillman, probably three or four times a week. And Clarence and myself and Ernest Milam went to all the hunts around, you know. And uh, long, getting on further into it, I was hunting a jeep at that time named Prudy that was off of Robertson's Black Bandit and I'd got from Jarvis. She sounded like two dogs treeing when she treed. She was a tree dog. And uh, she wasn't much count, though. She had about half her coons, you know, but she was impressive everywhere else. But a lot of people liked her. I wasn't one of them. But uh, anyway, I was hunting her, and Ace got old enough to hunt, and this other dog got old enough to hunt, and I told Junior, the other dog was perfect picture of a black and tan. Both of them were really good-looking dogs. Ace had a white spot in his chest. So G- Clarence Stillman took him. I, that was his dog, mine and his dog. We were partners on it. And he got him started. Going, well, he didn't really get him started going. He just carried him hunting, and he started on his own, just bam, first night, you know, when he behind other dogs and all. So I got him back from him, and I started hunting him, and I'd hunt him by himself, even though he wasn't about seven months old. And I'd hunt him with that dog I was talking about that was real rough at the time. And uh, I still had him, and I, la- I traded right of him for that Jeff at a later date, and then sold the Jeff back to him because he wanted to breed. And uh, he did breed her several more times. And I know that Gage dog was a litter under Ace, and I think Solid and Gage were litter mates. I never bought another puppy out of her. Ace is the only one I ever had out of her. But... Uh, and, and and Ace come from that litter where the whole litter died, and he was the only dog that lived? He was the only one that lived. Huh. Now, the story was that he killed all his litter mates, but that didn't happen. <laughs> that was just the story that was told. Well, I, I got a buddy that's got an English dog, and he had her artificially bred, and they had one puppy. That's all they had out of the litter. It's got kind of a kind of an ironic deal that... Uh, that's kind of what happened with Ace. She ended up being the only puppy in the litter. Yeah. we I met Jay Tibble during that time, you know. I had a dog called Satan Wing, 
Anyway, during that time, I'd met him, and, and he wanted, he liked a black dog, and he wanted one. He had one, and I was going to buy it from him, but he sold it to somebody else down south of Mississippi. Long story short, he wanted to buy Ace, and so I told Junior, I said, well, do we want to sell him or not? And I said, he, he ain't worth much, he ain't about 13, 11, 11 months old, I think, at that time. Jake met me down there at the Dixon National. I think it's the first hunt we ever put Ace in. I could be wrong about that. I probably had him in a hunt before that and just can't remember it. But anyway, I carried him down there and Jay went on the cast with me. Of course, we was hunting with four and five year old dogs. And I won a cast and could have won the whole hunt, but I, I, I had to cast one, so I held back Ace Tree the second coon or third coon. And I held back on training him because I wanted to assure myself of a win, cast win. Yeah. And I wound up getting second place in the Dixie National, and that was the biggest hunt in Mississippi at that time. It was. And so that was pretty prestigious deal, you know. But And we, Junior and I started competition hunting him, and then Jay finally... I don't. I guess he offered a four thousand dollars, or maybe I asked him four thousand, knowing the dog wasn't worth over two, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, back then, but anyway, Jay Jay wanted him, and I, he he called me and said he's gonna take him. And I said, well, look, uh, I said I don't think me and Junior really want to sell this dog, but I said we priced him, and and I definitely am not gonna back out on my word, you know. Yeah. But I said, if you could, give yourself a week and see if you can find something else. So he called Gene Hicks uh-huh. and tried to buy, can't remember one of them dogs' names, but he had two dogs at that time that was real good dogs. One of them was Albert. Yeah. But anyway, he tried to buy either one of them. Gene wouldn't sell either one of them, so we wound up having to sell him to Jay. We didn't have to, but we wound up selling him to Jay. And Jay kept him in hunting about two months and then sent him up here and paid me to hunt him. Mm-hmm. And Junior and I took that $4,000 and I went to Texas and bought TikTok Doc, an English dog. Okay. That uh, was Loomis bred. He was a fine hound. He had a clock in his head. He'd stay treated 58 minutes and he'd get leave if you didn't get to him. So if you didn't get to him in 58 minutes, he's gone? He's gone. Every time now. This didn't happen one or two times. Yeah. Every time that he had to stay treated, 58 minutes he left. So so you, you wasn't partial to just a black and tan. You just wanted to hunt a good dog. Good, solid coon dog. Okay. And I liked English, but uh, I had an English too, you know. Uh-huh. But a real nice English called Will Run Penny of Red and White Oak Spotted English Dog, and I won everything with her. I had a lot of fun with that dog. Yeah. But uh, I sold her to Irvin Manson Gill, and I didn't really wasn't looking to sell her, but he called me. No, wait a minute. I'm telling you wrong. It wasn't Irvin Manson Gill. I can't remember the man's name now, but him and his dad hunted. They they well known. I just can't remember his name. But he got he got me to put on an airplane, and give me thirty five hundred for him. Filthy rich at that time, you yeah, know, that yeah. kind of money. Yeah. She was already a grand knight, dual grand knight, three uh-huh. years old, but I'd done, done all I wanted to do with her. Yeah. And so so you after you sold Ace, you went and got the, the dock dog from yeah. Texas. Yeah. And, and what what did you did you competition hunt him? Yeah, me and Junior did. Junior hunted him more than I did. Yeah. Both of us competition hunted him some, Junior mostly. And we sold that guy to some guy in Alabama wanted to buy him and Give us a profit. Of course, that, back then, that's what I'd do. I'd yeah. sell him in a heartbeat, you know. Yeah. So I we sold him and uh, bought a dog called Sissy. Uh-huh. It's a, the Commodore that lives in South Carolina. Yeah. I think that's who I sold that jip to. But anyway, we bought a dog named Sissy from uh, Roland Dickey. Okay. And that was a good dog. But if you turned her loose in the edge of the woods... Headed four dogs in there, and it's a 2,000 acre plowed field behind you. She went across that 2,000 acre field. She would not ever go with the dog, not two steps. So she wanted to be by herself? She was by herself and, every and, time. And this was an English dog? or, or English, black? red tick English. Red tick field. English, okay. And I can't tell you, we sold her, but I can't tell you why or, or anything. I guess getting aggravated with her trying to hunt her competition her like that yeah down here 
I, I can't really answer that, but we sold her. Wasn't nothing wrong with a dog. Well, shoot, that, nowadays, that's what people look for. They want oh, one. Oh, yeah. You cut them Well, it was them, too. You know, she yeah. had a coon when she treated. Yeah. But she's always going to be third or fourth track dog because everything is tracked right in front <laughs> of you. She'd be trying to get away from them. Yeah. But she treated enough coons. She wanted quite a bit. A lot better dog than they thought she was yeah. than when I bought her. You know, uh, anyway, getting back to Ace and me and Junior. Hey, guys, this is Jason over at the Coonhound Collective Podcast. Is your dog box starting to get war? Maybe it's starting to get a little crack like mine is. Maybe you've just been thinking about it's time to upgrade to a to a new box, but you've asked your buddies and you're just not real sure what direction to go in. Well, let me help you out here. Go check my friends out at CZ Welding and Fabrication Custom Dog Boxes and Aluminum Products on Facebook. You can check out all their custom work they do there and their designs that they do. If you don't see something that you don't exactly like there, reach out to Nathan at 540-810-5439, 540-810-5439, or send him a message through the Facebook page. I bet he can fix you up. Don't wait till fall to get that new dog box. Go ahead, get that dog box now. Get you you something looking good in the back of your truck that, that you can be proud of and that you can haul your dog around in comfort. Check my friends out at CZ Welding and Fabrication. You won't go wrong. Dog boxes built by hunters for hunters. Get yours today. CZ Welding and Fabrication. After we did that, we had a uh, we sold TikTok dog and bought a red tick dog from somebody, and it 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 wasn't much good. It slick treat a lot too. You know, it had a good reputation, but it wasn't much count. It was all right. It go hunting and mine good and. Tree enough coons to keep you interested. I, some way or another, I got Junior's half of that dog. I think I got the dog and Junior got the boot, the money, mm-hmm. when we traded dogs. That's what okay. happened. And uh, I told Jay after I hunted Ace a couple months, I said, man, I don't think I was charging him. He, I, he didn't, I didn't try to charge him nothing. He just offered me like $200, $250 a month. Yeah. I hunted him about three months, and I said, man, that's seven hundred and fifty dollars. I called him and told him, I said, it ain't no need you paying me to hunt this dog like that. That's way too much money. Of course, he had money, but you never knew he had two nickels to rub them together. Uh-huh. But uh, anyway, he, I told him, I said, I want to. He give half interest in the dog to his dad-in-law, Lee Evans. I said, I want to see if Mr. Lee will sell me his half. Well, Lee wanted that red chick, so he traded me his half of Ace for the red chick. Okay, so, so that's how you ended back up with Ace. They ended what, what, back what up with happened? Ace. Me and Jay still wasn't 15 months old, yeah. 16. Not a lot of stories and a lot of dogs, but he was less than 18 months old, I think. But okay. we started comp- I started competition hunting him, and uh, we... We wound up with Ace and a dog called Hovey. Yeah. And we went to the World Hunt with Ace, UKC World Hunt one year, I think in 94. And we draw a dog called Little Blackie from Missouri. She was routing, Thomas routing on her. And she actually put up more points during that year's qualifying and the World Hunt plus points than any dog in it. And probably should have won the World Hunt, but long story short, she didn't win it. And yeah. Thomas always said it was his fault. She didn't win it, didn't get further. I'll right. put it that way. Right. And uh, anyway, we, we wound up, Jay wound up going to Missouri. I couldn't go with him. And he wound up buying that chip. And so we had Ace and uh, all three of them were winners. Ace, Hobie, and the female. Little well, Blackie. and I was going to ask you about the Hobie doll because I, I, I heard he ain't no slouch. He wasn't no slouch. Oh, he's he? a good ham. Yeah. I've had people come down here. To breed the ace and i'd carry ace and hobie hunting i remember one particular night now ace normally would beat hobie if you hunted them five times ace would win three okay but that's about it on an average but that particular night we carried them hunting and hobie treed five coon ace treed four coon and the last tree ace was on was out across a big lake couldn't get to him and i hollered for him to heal and after you hollered I trained him that way. Yeah. When you holler at heel, 
he shut off right that second and would come straight to you. He'd never make another bark, not one. Boy, boy, a good handle on a, on a hound is, is worth a gold mine. Oh, yeah. I For remember sure. Mark Summer always up there in that cast I was telling you about, with little black at that hunt. Uh-huh. And they got out in a 500-acre cornfield, if it was an acre, running a fire out of a cone and the hunt run out. Yeah. And we didn't have a chance to win no way. Little Black had done smoked up. <laughs> and I throw my spotlight out there and hollered Ace real loud and hollered Hill. He shut off. Mark looked at me like I was crazy, you know, and he said, you think that dog's coming? I said, you ain't heard him bark, eh? And by the time I was saying that, he heard him coming through the corn. He kicked the dirt real hard, you know. Dang, man, I'd give anything if I had a dog to do that. A, a, handle, a handle is worth a lot to me. I know some guys don't care. They, they want them to go and don't come back. But to me, a handle is worth a lot. Oh, yeah, it was. Ace was a good, hard hunting dog. Now, he throwed some dogs that didn't hunt very good. But mm -hmm. he never failed to go hunting. He went hunting. You could turn him loose with a full in he jip right beside him in the woods, and he went on hunting. Yeah. Now, I remember back... I, me and Junior, between me and Junior in 1992, he was born in 91, January 91. Okay. In 1992, we hunted him, just scattered hunts and made him a night champion to hunt him in UKC. And I think he was number 24 or 25, I don't forgot how they did it, but had the black and tan uh, hunt, you know, championship hunt in Hamburg, Arkansas. And I went over there, because we're going over there to hunt anyway, and of course, I want to see all them higher powered black and tans. And, yeah. uh, Eddie Fender with Sugar Cookie, and uh, Tam Young with Fiddler again, yeah. or something again. It was one of them dogs like that, but it's a real good dog. And in fact, Tam had a couple of good dogs in that hunt, but they got eliminated on the first round. I can't tell you how. And I really don't even remember how I won the first round. I don't even remember who I drew. But in the late round, it got down to where it was Sugar Cookie, which was a national champion, leading dog in the nation, and Tosac Tom Bill. Now, he was all for Tam's dogs, but John Chingalani owned him, and he was about a third strike dog. He wasn't a good strike dog, but he was a coon trier. Mm -hmm. He was a dog to beat at this time in this year. That's a dog you did not want to draw when you went to a hunt with Tosac Tom Bill. But it was froze ground, water everywhere, you know, froze, no leaves, dead winter in March. And uh, we drew out, I mean, we went out the late round, and all my buddies left, went on home, I was there by myself. And uh, they, they knew I couldn't beat that Tosac Tom Bill dog, but, and I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know that this is truth, and somebody may contradict this, but when we went on that cast, Tosec Tom Bill would not leave sugar cookie. Ace wouldn't pay her no attention. Ace treated a coon on him right off. We found it. And then Ace treated another coon, and he treated under water. And they just come out of that road. You had to treat your dog immediately behind the bark. Mm -hmm. Just that year. And they had been out a month or two. And Ace located and treed. And I sat there and I treated him, but he wasn't barking. Had his head stuck in that hole on that water. <laughs> So I got mine, and then he come back and locate, and I treated him again. And we went in there, and I remember Eddie Defender was terrible upset about that dog. It looked puppy whooping him, you know. I yeah. mean, it bothered him bad. I looked down. I got my head wet. I got down there and looked and seen the coon in the hole. So Clay Young was judging the final cast. He got down there and looked in the hole, seen the coon. But I won, that, I won a breed hunt that year with that pup. You know, against two of the best dogs I've, that's ever been in the black and tan breed. Yeah. So that was something to be proud of and a good accomplishment back then. When I, I remember playing this day, just like right now, we walked back in that clubhouse, and Tam asked Clay, he said, who won? He said, Eddie did with, with that uh, ace dog. He said, what did he look like? He said, look like a coon dog. He <laughs> treated three coons on that cast. Clay yeah. told him he looked like a coon dog. Yeah. Now, that was one of the first major hunt we hunted him in, and uh, we probably should have never bred that dog when we did, but Jarvis Hunt was just jumping up and down for me to breed in one of his jilt. And I did, and I, if I had to do old, I wouldn't have never bred him until he's five or six years old. Yeah.
Are you tired of whipping, scolding, and shocking to make them get a loan? Is your buddy tired of helping you set your dog up for correction night after night? Do you really want your dog to be alone because you forced him to be? Or would you rather him be alone because he wants to be? Grand Knight Champion Small Town Loan Survivor is the product of over 25 years of strong natural-born independent traits. This bold trait has been passed down from generation to generation and is showing up in loner offspring today. Loner is a direct son of Hall of Fame Grand Knight Champion Cabin Creek Rowdy and Grand Knight Champion Lonesome Dove Lori. Loner has a booming mouth that is talked about in every cast he has been in, including the 2021 World Hunt Finals. Loner is a no-reverse, ball-mouth open trailer who ends it plussed up with a huge dying locate and steady chop. Loner loves getting split and is a stay-put gun pressure tree dog. Loner's intelligence is also impressive. He knows over 12 voice and hand signal commands. Loner has a character that loves like Jesus, but he doesn't walk on water. If you're interested in breeding to Loner, contact Brett Stevens at Small Town English Kennels at 417-300-3777 or find him on Facebook. If you're interested in running a stud ad for your dog here on the Coonhound Collective podcast, reach out to us at thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. Send us a message through Facebook or Instagram, and we'll be glad to get with you to get your ad built and get your pricing on all of our ads. But anyway, I bred him. and uh, how, how old was he at this time? He barely, in it two, just barely just two. Just barely two, okay. Yeah. And that, that hunt was actually in 93. Okay. But... Uh, it it was four ninety two black and tan breed rates just gotcha. added in ninety three. I don't forget what all it won in ninety three. He won several things in ninety three. I know he won a state race in uh-huh. ninety three. He won a breed hunt. He won a state race. And we're talking PKC. PKC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he might have won. Uh, I don't know. I'm not gonna say he won the state. Uh, I just know he won a breed hunt and a breed race, and I, I think he won the state. I know he did. He won the state race that year, too. Okay. And um, then, you know, I finished him the dual grand that year. A lot of things got done that year. I remember in one of them ads I, I, I had read, he was, uh, I have a phone I'd look at, but he was had 3,000-something points, plus points, in four hunts, and zero miles and whatever number of circle in UKC trying to make him a grand knight. I had to add, and he just had four wins at that time. Holy cow. But that, you know, just think, read back, seeing them things, you done forgot them, you know. I have. I don't really, I'm not real sentimental, you know. I, don't, I remember I talking about that. I remember that little blackie dog was four of us, Randy Smith was one of them. I don't forgot who else. We was hunting up there on a, about a, Three quarter mile, a half mile off Blacktop Road, mm-hmm. and she went the opposite direction. Them dogs had done treat a couple of possums. She done treat one coon, and she got minus. You know, she time caught her on track. Mm-hmm. And after the hunt was over, I picked her up, went down the highway, and she done got run over. And I brought her back up there and pulled a collar off of her, threw her in the ditch. And they said, man, I can't believe you throw that dog in the ditch. You got a dog that, well, you need to take her and bury her. I said, man, all I can say is a good one gone, bring another on, you know, that's it. Yeah. And they didn't appreciate me very much <laughs> that night, none of them. But they all did know me, though. Yeah. Just kind of matter of fact, blunt, yeah. you know, of what I do and say. But that 94... I mean, 93, Ace was in the na- first national hunt PKC had. And Junior Stillman had him, handled him, and there were 50-something dogs there. And he got in the final three, and it was John Evans and Junior and Leroy Gamble with uh, Hillbilly Mike. I couldn't think of his name, but he won a bunch in yeah. right at the same time, about the same age as Ace. And we, that late round, they drew out, and... Uh, 
the daylight called him. And he said a hundred strike and he'll be the Mike had seventy five and John had twenty five. Well John wanted to hunt because he only had twenty five minus and of course I had a hundred minus. Junior had a hundred minus. Junior still and we lost that, but they were trees across the lake and it's full daylight, seven thirty in the morning, and they go up there where they treated at and John and Leroy and whoever the guide was was trying to figure out a way to get across that lake around that lake to get them dogs. You know, it's gonna be a long couple hour trip. And Junior didn't say nothing, he just hollered. He said, hey, he's ill. Said he never made another bar. Dropped off that tree and swam that lake and come to him, said all of them was kicking and cussing. Oh, I bet, I bet. <laughs> Aggravated, you know. And uh, next year, Don Ridman had him up at his house. And I can't remember why Don Ridman had him up there, but he had him. What, for whatever reason. And uh, he hunted him in the Nationals. And I do remember the first round in that, that's 94. The first round in that Nationals, he drew uh, a dog called Whitey. His name was Clover. Doug Jackson hunted him. He was a super nice dog and swamp rooster. And I can't remember the other dog, but he won that cast with these. And uh, y'all, the late round, and they drove up there to turn loose. And uh, I... I think David Carr was in the cast because he won the cast with Elmo. But they turned loose and Ace treat two coons on them. And then after that, Ace just got quiet, just kind of disappeared, you know, and so did Kurt Sievert. How you pronounce that guy on the old plot, dog? Uh, Kurt Sievert? Sievert? I, I don't, don't know, know, but yeah. I bet you everybody knows yeah. what I'm talking about. But his, him and Ace, his dog and Ace come up missing. Well, the dogs got kind of scattered, and uh, Don, you know, David Dow was judging, but Don told him, he said, something ain't right about it, you know, but he just, anyway, he minus him for time catching or whatever, and they called time out. Well, they couldn't even pick up Ace or Kurt's dog, neither one, and whoever was waiting in the truck at the cast had done left, and they found Ace seven miles from there, and the way they found him, people called Jay, and told him they had this dog. 15, 20 minutes there, they come up missing. And uh, seven miles away. Holy and God. he called me and told me, and I got, he didn't know Junior's number, and I called Junior and told him where it was. He went up there and got him. They had him in the house. Junior said they was feeding him snacks and two little <laughs> girls playing with him and all. They just loved that dog, you yeah. know. And they found Kurt's dog tied to a man's barn out there. The man didn't even know he was tied out there. Oh my goodness. So that that went on that year. And I'll skip from there. We didn't hunt him a whole lot after that in the hunt. But we did hunt him in the world hunt in 95. Okay. And Clarence Stillman was handling him. And I don't forget who he drawed early, but anyway, he won his early round. And he was on a late round. And Ace had treated a coon on him. And then Ace was treated again. And, uh, I don't know who was judging. I don't forgot who was judging, but Junior told him he, they never shut up when he treated, never shut up. And he shut up, he told him, he said, there was two people in the truck out there. I know both of them, I ain't gonna call their names, but one of them was kind of involved in another incident. But there was two people in the truck out there, and when they, they called time out because the dogs had scattered. When Junior went back to the truck, you couldn't carry a tracker with you back uh -huh. then. Junior went back to the truck and got his tracker. He couldn't pick him up at all. And he'd been less than 30 minutes. And uh, then I called him, told him where the dog was. They was on time out then. Junior drove straight down there and got him. He said, my dog ain't no, he might be fast, but he said he can't get seven miles up there without somebody carrying him up there, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that happened on that. We just said the heck with it. Jay was sick. When lost him, Don found him in a strip mine, you know, uh, at the National Hunt when he come up missing and Don and him. He found him in a strip mine, Kurt's dog tied to a barn, and then Ace winds up the next year way down there, seven miles from where they turned loose at a place. Yeah. We had some handlers back them days that was in the relocation business or moving <laughs> business, whichever you want to call it, you know. 
And it wasn't just one, it was two or three of them. I know one young guy, I ain't gonna call his name either, but they absolutely ruined that kid, made an outlaw out of him, in my opinion. Yeah. He's from Tennessee. But I ain't calling his name, I ain't calling nobody's name, I'm just stating facts, and most people gonna know anyway. Yeah. But I'm just telling you, that's why, that end, that's the last hunt he was in, a major hunt, uh -huh. and Jay got cancer, and I hated breeding. And he told me, he said, if you'll keep him and breed him, I'll give you every penny you get off stud feet business. We won't, won't split it no more. And Jimmy Reese wanted to buy him, and we sold him to Jimmy. And Jay didn't want to sell him. He did not want to sell him. And I kind of regret that I didn't keep putting up with it, but I just despise not getting to go hunting and having to sit there and meet people. Right. And... People what? from the south would come breed the dog and leave. Mm -hmm. People from Alabama or wherever. But certain people from certain areas would come down and stay two or three days and want you to entertain them the whole time. And I work for a living. Yeah. I work 10 hours a day and they drive two hours to a hunt, $10 hunt, $15 yeah. hunt. And they just took all that away from me and the hunting part. So I didn't like it. I didn't like breeding, but... And we had a whole bit stood too, we breeding both of them. Well, and, and before we hit record here, I, I had looked it up, and, and Ace was definitely doing his part as far as breeding, because I think there's 1,400 and some odd puppies yeah. that, that he sired out there. So that's that's quite a, bit of, quite a bit of females being bred right there for sure. Oh, it was a good deal, you know. I mean, he was probably the most popular stud dog there, and he was definitely... If one of the best dogs in his time from 95 back to 92, he's definitely one of the best dogs hunting on the circuit yeah. out of any of them. Yeah. Russ Beller offered Jay $20,000 for him and he wouldn't take it. And then Jamie Perry offered him 20000 and didn't he wouldn't take it. Well, we sold him Jimmy for 12 when he was six because just didn't want to fool. I didn't want to fool with the breeding. And Jay didn't eat it. He was sick. Yeah. He was getting to you for cancer. And he didn't like that breeding stuff a bit better than I did. He, in fact, he probably liked it less than I did. <laughs> I met a lot of good people right. breeding that dog that I might have not met. I wouldn't have met without breeding. And actually, it turned out it's the right thing to do because he did improve the breeding. I don't think nobody had ever argued with that. Right. And Ace was strong, strong track dog. He was a way head and shoulders above about anything you ever turn him loose with on tracking. I remember uh, had him up in Indiana one time at a, a big cornfield out there and dogs truck, they turned loose in the middle of that cornfield and it was a water hole there and them dogs struck four of them right there at that cornfield. Mm -hmm. They took the track, went all the way across the field and got under a fence row and got tree and uh, them dogs were still there and they started trailing and the five minutes got passed on the tree before they ever trailed to the same tree he was treating on. It's the kind of track dog he was. Yeah. And he was a one bar absolutely from day one, from the time he was seven months old, he was a one bar tree dog. When he located, if it was his locate and you treat him, he'd be there. He definitely was a one bark tree dog. So he's an easy dog to handle because he's louder than about anything you hunt him with. Uh -huh. The only thing I can think of it I hunted with that was as loud as Ace was a dog called Homer's Gomer. Yeah. And he's a walker dog. We drew him in a reading a qualifying hunt. And uh, I think we won. I know we qualified over there in Alabama. I don't know if we beat Homer's Gomer or somebody else in the cast. I don't think nobody else in the cast beat us. Cause they, about Ace made a tree and that dog made a tree and I know both of them had coon. Next tree they made, they made together. Mm -hmm. And them dogs were so loud, them other two dogs wouldn't get on the tree with them. They yeah. wasn't blowing at each other. They were just that loud and overpowering. They just intimidated. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, did y'all have some puppies out of Ace that y'all were that y'all hunted or, or messed oh, with? Oh yeah, him? several of them. What 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 kind of traits was he putting in his puppies and well, passing on? Good tracking's one of them, but the strong point I guess was stay put tree dogs. You know, I'm not saying that just from the ones I had, but that's what everybody says. So right. I go along with it. 
But the uh, first puppy we had out of him was called Set em Up Joe. Okay. He's out of a dog over here in Greenville, Mississippi. Second jip we bred, Jeff Jarvis is first. I don't think it had one puppy, the best I can remember. But when we bred this jip, she uh, had several puppies, and they went to local hunters. And Floyd Kennedy, a friend, a really good friend of mine, he's dead now, but got killed, not instantly, he died from an accident, tractor tire run over, tractor wheel run over him. But uh, he had this pup, he brought him over here, and I think it was in January, and we was hunting up at Hawkeye, Mississippi, and the ground was froze. Uh -huh. And uh, I didn't know Floyd's first time I ever met him. And he wanted a thousand dollars for that puppy. And he was about seven, eight months old. That was a big prize for a seven, eight month old puppy. And he wasn't a pretty dog either. He looked good enough, but he was kind of a small dog and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, long story short, he run a deer. A Street, two or three coons, he run a deer. He wouldn't pay Ace no attention. And I tried to talk him down. He said, no, nah, he ain't come down, you know. So I paid him a thousand dollars and bought the dog and never made a treat. <laughs> and and he was a fine little hound. And Harold Kirk's come over here and brought two jips to breed days. And that puppy was still just a puppy, like nine to 10 months old. And we was hunting, he heard that puppy struck a track. He wouldn't pay no attention to anything. He struck a track and worked it out there about 20 minutes and got treed and went about five or 600 yards. We went in there and shot the coon out and he treed another coon. And Kurt Harrell said, you know that ace is an impressive dog, but he said, how in the world can you not be impressed with that 10 month old puppy working them tracks, the kind of tracks he's working and coming up with a coon, you know? Yeah. And I, I remember another story about that deal there with Harold Kirk. Janet sent two dogs over here to be bred, and one of them had never had a puppy. They were litter mates. And so we bred one of them just right off. They were both in the heat. Harold stayed about three days. The other one wouldn't ever, Ace wouldn't breed her. She's flagging, flagging, wouldn't breed her. And my vet's a old country vet, minor pack kind of guy, just no boys crap, you know, just straight to the point. And Harold went up there, and we, Harold said, let's go do an ovulation test. So we went up there to Andy Johnson, Dr. Andy Johnson's clinic, to do that ovulation test. And he done it, and he called us back, and told, he called Harold back, and told him, said, uh, your dog's gonna be ready to breed in 11 days. And I remember Harold, no, he called and told me to come up there. We went up there. Told Harold, he said, dog will be ready to breed. She'll ovulate in 11 days. Harold said, doc, I hate to dispute your words. said, that dog's done been in the heat about the 16th, 17th day. And said, ain't no way she'd be ovulating in 11 days. Andy Johnson looked at him and said, I don't give a damn if you've been in heat 34 days. In 11 days, she'll ovulate and she'll take a dog. He said, she'll take a dog now, you just won't breed her. He said, the dog is smarter than y'all. <laughs> Talking about Ace, you yeah. know. In 11 days, he left her, and she bred, and she had seven puppies. Yeah. That's unreal to me. That's unreal for a dog to go almost 28, 29 days yeah. before they ovulate. Uh, yeah. But I guess you, that's the reason, I guess, if you're in the breeding business, you ought to check all that. I ain't never going to be in the breeding business. Yeah. And might be a surprise to a lot of people that don't know me to realize that I don't raise a puppy from seven, eight weeks old up. Ace is one of the few, very few I ever raised. Yeah. I, I can count them on one hand and have fingers left. Yeah. You know, but I just hate little bitty puppies. Now, when they get six months old, old enough to get out from under my feet, yeah. I'm, I'm all in then, you know. Till then, I ain't all in. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, before we completely move off that, talk about Hobie a little bit, because he's a dog that y'all run stud ads on, too, and bred some females also. What, what kind of dog was Hobie? Where did he come from? Hobie was a super nice dog. He was Myers bred dog, and I got him from Randy Smith, lives uh, 80 miles from here at that time on Willow Point Hunting Club. Me and Randy's real good friends, always been good friends since I first met him. And uh, 
I go up there and go hunting with him, big hunting camp, go hunting with him some. And we hunted Ace and Hovey together a lot. And Hovey, Hovey was real accurate, but he was a track driving, dunk running dog. I don't think he even could trail day up. Ace could really trail day up. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, he was a real good track driving dog, and he had a mouth that was just, I could hear it. But uh, I've treated him before, and people, like, I remember one particular night, it was driven in rain, I treated him, we were just pleasure hunting, me and Keith Watson. And uh, Keith said, Eddie, that ain't no dog. He knew I couldn't hear him. He said, Eddie, that ain't no dog. I said, do you hear the crickets hollering way in there? He said, yeah. I said, that's holy. <laughs> and, and that's what he had, you know. Uh, I think Greg Hodges uh, described in the best. He said, with old holy trees, he sounds like a backup beeper on a garbage truck. <laughs> but, man, he was a hound. He was a nice hound. He, every win he got, he deserved it. He just out-tuned all everything around him. Yeah. He, and he could do it, too. He didn't have nothing else on it, no food, nothing on his mind, nothing but coon hunt. Yeah. But uh, Ace had him when, when I was hunting them both, you know, like I told you, Ace would win three out of five cats. But the only way Ace would win, he was a first track dog, which Hogan was a good strike dog. He was a first track dog, had better nose, and he was faster on a track than Hobie. Hobie was fast, mm -hmm. but he was fast. And uh, Ace had that drive. He had to drive to him, you know. But Ace would, when he, the only times he beat Hobie, he'd treat one layup that Hobie didn't know. Hobie didn't care no way. He didn't want to go with Ace, you know, and Ace didn't care about going with him. They treated them all together a bunch, but they wasn't dogs looking to get treated with each other. But Ace would treat that layup, and Hobie wasn't getting none of it, and he get 200 points on him. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That Rex Allen dog we had, which I hadn't mentioned him, but Thomas Armstrong bought him over in Arkansas. Now, he was a Myers bred dog. I think he was raised in Black Horse. Might have been his daddy. I believe it was. But uh, he was a 120-minute tree dog in August. I mean, he was, he was a tree dog out of this world. But I've seen him not just one or two nights, several nights. You get up there and you get to run and flood it, timber and little down stuff in there. And mm -hmm. after about 20 minutes, some coons would run like in a rice field. They'd run for an hour that you couldn't put them up. But uh, they'd be running super hard. And in a minute, old Rex, he couldn't stand it no longer. He'd pull up trees. There wouldn't be nothing up there. And they used to trip <laughs> coon 100 yards from him. Yeah, you know? yeah. But he was a super nice hound, old Rex Allen. I, I believe that dog, he probably throwed some good dogs, but in my opinion, he would have re really been a nice stud dog because he was top end strike dog too. Mm -hmm. now, he wasn't track dog. He wasn't nowhere close to track dog at Ace Wood. Mm -hmm. And neither, neither was Hobie. But Hobie would bog down. But when he'd bog down, Randy had him trained. You could walk out there and turn. I've done it in hunts several times. Just walk out there and turn my light on real bright and just kind of swish around toward him. He'd leave there. Next time you heard him, he'd be treating under a red hot coon. He'd have them every time. Because he wasn't stopping till he'd run over top of one. Yeah. And he'd have every one of them. Yeah. It's tricks and tricks, you know, yeah. to all of them. It's something to learn about all of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I never could hear real good, but uh, as a my whole family can't hear. They have one person out of five in mean, the kids that could actually hear, you know. Yeah. And uh, well, I've been accused of faking it a bunch, but I, that was only because I knew what kind of dog you was hunting and what kind of handler you were, and I played off of it, and they thought I could hear a lot better at times than I actually could. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't hear real good. I, I probably would have won a little bit more if I'd have been able to hear good. Yeah. yeah. But... I never did win nothing super big, you know. Me and old Hobie won a uh, pro hunt, four thousand yeah. dollar pro hunt, and that may be the biggest. I think I got a bigger check in a world hunt with a Walker dog than he had, but that may be the biggest single 
money winning hunt I ever had, you know. Yeah. I've been third a bunch of times and second a bunch of times, a few yeah. times. Blackie, I had third with her the three days after we bought her in a pro hunt in Texas. i never forget that hunt. Oh, uh, I wish I could think of that dog's name. They got a dog now, and Bobby Woods is hunting the dog now with the same name. I've seen it in a, in a, at a hunt somewhere. But they had a super nice walker dog, and I remember being amazed to go over there and they bid them hunts off Calcutta mm -hmm. and Guy Manning and Bobby Woods. Uh, Bobby Woods' daddy, I can't think of his name, but and he had an uncle. I think his uncle and daddy was been, been on the dog together, evidently. But I went over there and I drew them, and they bid like $150, $170 on a dog, $200, $250. Yeah. It just leave me out in the cold, you know. <laughs> And I drew him over there in that hunt. And this is kind of, it's comical because everybody knew that dog was going to win the cast. We went out and hunted the whole cast over. And I knew I won because I won on a tiebreaker rule. But none of them knew it. All of them, they, they done misfigured. You know, I could I always keep figures in my head, no yeah. problem. And when the cast was over, they was all congratulating Mr. Woods. Not not Bobby's daddy, but Bobby's uncle. I can't remember his name. Everybody was congratulating him. When it got down to me and went to shake my hand, I said, congratulations on second place in the cast. And everybody just went into shock. What are you talking about? I said, y'all better add that scorecard up before you figure out who the winner is. Of course, they added it up, and I won it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And then I drew out the late round, and little Blackie and another dog went back to the tree after they left. Then they went on hunting after that, and Blackie struck a track way down there, 300 yards from that tree, and trailed a coon right back to that same tree and treed on it. But it had two coons in it this time, but I got scratched for treeing on the same tree three times, which is a rule, you know. Yeah, yeah. I wound up third place in that hunt. I've had some interesting casts for sure, you know. Yeah, I, I would I would say so. Is there, is there any other puppies out of Ace that sticks out in your mind? Well, old Chance, a big, he had a head that big around as a basketball, but he is one that sticks out to me. And he he won a breed race. He won a state race. Won. I don't know if he ever won a breed hunt or not. I can't remember that. But he won a lot. And he was consistent. But he never was good for about two coons, you know, in two hours. Three trees, two coons. Yeah. But, man, he won, like, something like 70% of his calf around here local. Mm -hmm. But you carry him up off somewhere where you got to have 500 to get in the finals, he ain't going to make it. Yeah. He wasn't that kind of dog. And the most interesting thing, and boy, it said something about that. I showed him my ad on Facebook the other day. And the boy come on there, and must Lee, I think his name's Steve Green. He come on there and said, we own set him up chance. Well, I remember when they bought him. They was from South Carolina. And I asked him, if you move that crate, he tried to eat you up if you grabbed it to slide it. The, the dog box? Yeah, the dog box in the truck. He didn't want nobody messing with that dog box in that truck. He didn't even want to want you to open the gate and let him out. <laughs> but uh, he grabbed, I asked him, I said, did you ever grab that box and try to slide it while you had him? He said, yeah, and I still got the scars on my hand today. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a good one off of Ace, you know. But that set him up, Joe Dog, he won a lot. Don Revan kept him up there at his house for... I don't know, quite a while, and I remember back then, uh, Mr. Robinson was hunting, Lawton Robinson was hunting a lot, and they lived fairly close together. He would tell me stories about Lawton just getting mad at that dog about pulling out a cast wind, you know, right at the end. But he, like I told you earlier, you know, he didn't pay no attention to nothing. He just went and done his own thing. There wasn't nothing classy about him. Right. Looked nothing. I seen him tree. In the hunt, I finished him the Grand Knight champion. That Joe dog treed up here, north of here. Royce Taylor was on the cast, I remember that, with a red bone. He was leading the cast. And they treed in a willow. 
tree out there in the middle of a weed field. And uh, when when they treed the coon, one of the coons jumped out of the tree. We didn't know it was two coons up the tree. Mm -hmm. Mine stayed, so he gonna get mine because it's slick. You know, we knew the coon jumped out. We was close enough we'd see the coon jump out. And they all lit out there. Well, old Joe was like Ace or Chance. He locked them toenails in, he was there. He sat there and kept trim, walked up there and I looked, I looked for a coon, you know, and they kind of laughed. They didn't even help me. I looked up there. I said, well, here he sit. They come over there and we scored that coon, and the dogs got hung up on that track, and I turned old Joe loose, and he went straight to them. And when they were bogged up on that track, he took that track and went right up the hill and treated that coon ahead of them <laughs> and won that cast and finished to a grand night. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good there. Yeah, that's real good, yeah. 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 But he was pretty common all the way around, in my opinion. He was a good, solid dog, but he was just pretty common. Chance wasn't nothing special either. He had a good mouth, great big old dog, and he was like a, he locked them toenails in. He wasn't moving. In fact, Stephen Gamma was up there in 95 and told me, I told him, I said, I'm about to burn this dog out in these hunts. He's hunting Sally back then, I think it was 94 or 5. And she was a real nice little hound off ace. And she won a truck, in fact. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyhow, he told me, sitting up there on Maven Hunting Club Port, I told him, I said, I think I'm gonna slack off a little chance. You're gonna probably win the breed race, cause I think I'm about to burn him out. He's sour and he don't like hunting in these hunts. And he laughed at me. He said, if you could win it, you would win it. You just backing out because you know Saturday's going to win it. <laughs> I said, well, I guess you're going to make me win it. And uh, they drew out together that night, and Clarence Stillman was on no chance. And uh, Stephen was telling this. He said when they started to the tree, he said, Sally quit trimming for a little bit and then went back to trimming and said, you could hear old Chance in there blowing like a lion. He said, he said, I was saying all the way, and he's killing Sally, because he knew Sally would stir up a little something. Uh -huh. He said, he's killing Sally. He's killing Sally. Now, he's telling me this story. He said, when he got in there, he got Sally and them all got caught pretty easy. She got scored on a tree because she was standing back, and I think it wound up being a hollow tree, best I remember. But there's a beehive in it. Oh, my goodness. And he said every time one of them bees is sting old uh, Chance, he said he'd blow like a lion. And said Junior had to walk in there and get him. He couldn't call him. See, he's just raking bees off of him and the dog both, you know, just off his back. And that uh, pretty well to stay put treat dog. Yeah, I, I would say so. I, I I wouldn't stay there. I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they didn't stay there either. But Chance didn't put them off. The bees put them off. Yeah. But I did go on, I'll go and finish that. I did go ahead and win that breed race that year with old Chan. Yeah. Just to make sure I got it in, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me and Chan, me and Steve, real good friends, you know. We, we've been to Oklahoma, we carried Ace out there to Oklahoma to get him together for semen. Uh-huh. And he was hunting her then. He didn't win a cast, and I won every cast I hunted in. Yeah. And the last night, they made us go back, and I won that final cast then, you know. Yeah, yeah. It hurts his feelings when that happened. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, which we've been at it for an hour, and I don't want to hold up your, no more of your time than I have to, but you said at the beginning when we were talking about Ace that you, that y'all started breeding him too soon. How, what, what do you think affected him with that? you think you could have won more with him if y'all would have held out? Yeah, I could have won more with him. I wouldn't care him to hunt because you could tie him to the tailgate. He wasn't paying no attention to dogs in the woods. Of course, he probably was a little more aggressive, you know, because of that. But he could tie him to the tailgate, and he'd bark at every male dog and growl at him and walk by. Yeah. I just got to where I didn't want to care no more. Plus, people picking him up and moving him sooner or later, they may pick him up and keep going with him. Yeah, yeah. And that had the biggest influence on us not hunting him anymore. But if I'd have never bred him, he probably would have, would have got quite as popular as he did. And they would have got, he, we would have been popular anyway because, you know, a bunch of people tried to buy, but yeah. two high beers I done told you about on that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I just, I, I know there's some people that, you know, they, they, they start breeding pretty quick when they're young, and then I know some other guys, they, they wait. and Well, they don't affect their dog the same, you know. Right. And it didn't affect him hunting, because I think that's the only reason I won that first breed hunt. Because I think Tosac Tom Bill, I, and I can't prove this, and I probably ought not see it, but I think Tosac Tom Bill following Cookie around because she was in the heat, and Ace was the kind of dog. He wasn't paying no attention yeah. to a dog when he was hunting. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't have a good a dog as Tosac Tom Bill back then, I can tell you that. Yeah. I definitely wasn't, no, wasn't in a handler as good as Eddie Fender, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. he was one of the top handlers in the country. Uh, you know, we didn't make many mistakes, me or John Chingalani either one. You know, we wasn't top handlers, but we didn't make many, too many mistakes. Yeah. We can hold our own. Yeah. Well, um, you got anything else you want to add before we can shut this down? Or? Well, I'll just tell you one, one story about okay. Ace. When he was about seven months old, my friend, I mentioned in this thing before, D. Turner, we were walking down the rise living. And Ace wasn't hunting. He just peeling in front of us, you know. Might not even been six months old, but ever how old it was, he he wasn't hunting. And but he would tree at that time. But he spotted a headlight a coon in a big old oak tree, sitting on the side of that rice field. And I, he was looking. He quit looking. And I wasn't telling him sick in the dog or nothing. But I just got to bumping my helmet. I got to watching that puppy got to winding. And I'd bump my helmet with my, uh, I don't know what I had in my hand, probably a pocket knife, I think. And he treated that coon. He went over there and treated That's the first coon he ever treated in his life by himself, completely yeah. by himself. And we shot it out. And that dog was so smart from that day on, and, I, and several people can witness this for you. We could be in a hunt, and I could head like a coon out there, and if Ace got nowhere close to it, I could bump it knife on my helmet and he might take him a minute but he'd find that coon and trim. Wow. I've done it after hunts just to show people that he'd do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that about wraps it we done bragged on lace about all we need to, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well Mr. Eddie, I appreciate you inviting me into your house and taking the time to sit out and do this with me and uh, there's a lot of history there that, that, that is going to be preserved now that we're, we're going to get out there that I'm sure people's going to want to hear. And uh, I, I appreciate you and Jay. I, I talked to Jay also. Uh, Y'all allowed me to do this. And Jay said, you'd be the man to talk to. You, you hunted him the most. So I, I really do appreciate you taking the time to be on here today. Well, that's fine. I really wasn't too big on doing no podcast with anybody. But... <laughs> He kind of wanted me to do it because of Ace, you know, so I made, I, I would, I'd do it, you know, we yeah. real good friends, best yeah. friends. Well, I, I truly do appreciate you taking the time to, to, to oh, sit yeah. down and talk about it today. And uh, Is there anybody else you want to thank or, or, or give a shout out to before we shut this down? I guess that's it, other than I'll just say one thing, that hundreds of people ask me all the time, call and tell me, and he said, well, you use the breeder of set em up face. Well, Eddie Muse didn't have anything to do with the breeding of set em up face. It was all Carmine Hart and Riley LaFoon. I just happened to get the puppy. Yeah. And I ain't, I've never felt like I promoted the black man breed, but of course I did because I did breed Ace, but it wasn't my intentions, so I'll put it that way. You, you was just hunting a good coon dog. That's all. And if I had it all to do old, I definitely would not breed that dog until he's five years old. I believe he would have won a world hunt yeah. if I'd have just kept him out of the breeding pen. Wow. But there's so many good dogs, and, and I guarantee you 90% of the people will tell you that that he added, that he put the state foot tree dog in the black and tans and the mouth. That's yeah. the two things they'll tell you. Well, I've seen a bunch of black and tan, and that brother breeze too, but a bunch of black and tans that was awful weak track dog. Mm -hmm. They get in a bog or water or something and hang up. Ace didn't have no hang ups, no yeah. work on yeah. the track. Yeah. I remember a guy from uh, New Jersey, New York, come down here, bred a dog, 
and we went hunting in the Ace Trail to Coon about 20 minutes, went across two sloughs, and went about 700 and something yards. Rough, rough, rough stuff. Been treating, had that coon. I was kind of chest blowed out. You know, that guy said, Oh, don't worry about it. Sometimes up there we trail them that long too. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't appreciate it, you know, too much. Yeah, yeah. Like I did. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, Mr. Eddie, I sure appreciate you being on the podcast today, and we're going to shut it down here, and I'm going to get back on the road. i got another seven hours to go. All right. Well, good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys, for listening to the Coonhound Collective Podcast today. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to listen to the podcast. If you don't mind, head over to Facebook and give us a like, and head over to Instagram and give us a follow. It's both at The Coonhound Collective. Also, if you would like to reach us here at The Coonhound Collective, you can reach us at thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. If there's someone that you would like to hear on the podcast or a product that you would like to hear talked about, please send it to thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. Thanks again. Have a great day.